everyone. Great that you guys are still pulling through. Final leg. Um, maybe people in the back. Maybe it's nice if you can go a bit to the front. Um, as we're with so few, you know. And we'd like to thank also all the 30 people still on the Zoom. Yes, uh, <laughs> does go, doesn't go unnoticed. Silent heroes. Okay, um, so right before the break, we actually um, made you do with the collab where we did the sim to sim, and now we're going to do the sim to real transfer of the policies. So we've received a few on Discord, and we will now be uh, testing them on the uh, on the real system here. Um, the render screen will open, and it will even say uh, the username of the person who uh, who uploaded the policy. So let's see how they uh, how they did. Ah, it's actually working. <laughs> So, uh, how are you? I don't know if you're still on uh, the Discord channel or well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's better than the one we showed in the first leg. So, <laughs> open your gym transfers. Pretty nice. Oh. Right. Can you give it a little tick to see if it's stable? Yes. Oh, it's in the reset. <laughs> so just to give you a bit of uh, background, uh, we had a few discussions about resets, right? So how EgerX is set up is that during the call of, uh, in the OpenAI gym, call reset, um, the user can actually specify to switch to different controllers that can perform resets. So obviously a reset that can reset to any arbitrary state would kind of uh, make the problem a bit uh, Trivial because then you would already have a controller that can initialize to any state. So, why learn one that can go to your private state? So, in this case, we just use a simple BID controller to, um, to reset to, uh, to the stable uh, downright equilibrium. But I mean, this is a very simple example. But um, uh, for example, with manipulator experiments, we've created a, a safety filter. And then behind the safety filter, we have a reset uh, routine. So essentially, both the actions that the reinforcement learning agent will provide are certified, but also the ones that um, that are um, yeah produced by the by the reset routine. So in this way, you can uh, yeah kind of modularly set up your uh, experiment and also use pre-trained controllers to initialize training. Okay, um, let me check the reference. Yeah. So what was the name? How do you? Have to do it? Not that. So let's now go to Jan. Uh, Jan Behrens, I believe. Oh, straight up right. <laughs> Crazy <laughs> performance. Thank you. Young. Last Hello. one. So I'm going to give you a bit more, like the idea of ERX is basically to have this graph of nodes and um, you interconnect these nodes together with objects and at runtime you choose the engine and it will swap out a subset of these nodes based on the engine you use. So if you have an engine um, called PyBullet, it will um, use the actuator nodes that are related to PyBullet, so they are custom to the uh, PyBullet. Oh, this is Retesh. Oh, um, okay. Nice. Um, but the nice thing is that if you, for example, uh, define an object to be a camera which produces images, you can uh, you can change the uh, the actual nodes that you will use to uh, when you specify the engine. So this also makes the rendering agnostic. So this allows you to um, to create uh, gym environments that have nice visualizations, as you can see here. But then when you switch to a different engine, you would have the same thing. Um, okay. So um, thank you, Ritesh, for participating. I'm going to kill the process. And um, let's go to the 
schedule. So what we did actually now is mostly cover in the um, yeah, trivial uh, classic pendulum swing up uh, problem, but in the end, this is a robotics conference and my supervisor always tells me that the pendulum is not a real robot. So let's now train with a real robot. And everyone likes quadruped, so let's try and make a quadruped walk. So um, if you go to the schedule, you can click on it. It opens up a new uh, collab and um, probably most of you are out of battery and programming on your phone might not be that ideal. So what we will do is now a more lecture style. I will try to code it up and I will ask you maybe um, your, your, your insights on what to do. Um, collaborative, programming. collaborative programming, maybe <laughs> hence the name. So first what I will do is again, um, select the GPU. So bear with me, this is going to be uh, taking a bit longer than the OpenAI pendulum. It's a quadruped. Uh, so first things first is we're gonna make sure your X is installed and process installed and source of code. And while it's installing, let me uh, briefly explain what we're going to do. Um, where is it? So the quadruped has four legs, as most of you probably know. And the idea is that we have controllers for the joints, uh, joint position controllers. So we give them a position and then the controllers will produce torques so that the, uh, the joints move towards the, uh, the, current, the desired locations. And um, the idea here, and the, the idea that Igarx tries to, 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 to Try to embody is that it's sometimes not necessary to learn a, um, a policy from the ground up. So basically, have a reinforcement learning agent learn the torques of a control of a, of a robot. But instead, you may use low level controllers such that you learn basically a higher level uh, policy that essentially um, makes slight modifications to um, low level controllers such that you can change the behavior of these low level controllers to do what you want. So in this case, in this example, we will already make use of a, a central pattern generator um, to produce us with a to, to, to um, produce us with a trot, so a walk or a gate for the quadruped that makes it walk straight ahead. So this uh, this trot is based on a hop oscillator, and basically the idea here is as follows: so this oscillator produces an open loop. Um, pattern for the feet, so for the four feet, so X and Z position, uh, and the Y is for default always zero. And it basically has two phases, a swing phase and a stance phase. And I won't go too much into detail of this uh, central pattern generator, but what it does is without any learning, you can already make a quadruped walk straight ahead. Now in this example, we would like to um, make this quadruped take a left turn. So if we make it learn a left turn and then evaluate for a longer period, it will actually start to work circles. And we will try to do so in under five minutes in collaboratory with limited computational resources. And the nice thing with eager X is that it's really easy to uh, create nodes, even though we won't show this here in the, uh, in the demo. The idea is that it's quite easy to, to define nodes, interconnect them, select appropriate rates, such that you can learn at a higher level and uh, get reduced training times to section. Um, so this picture, we have uh, the lag, and per default, the uh, open loop policy will produce um, X and Z positions, and these X and Z positions are then um, converted to the uh, joint positions for the quadruped's legs using the four kinematics. And per default, as I said, only the X and Z positions will be set, and the Y is per default zero. Now we will make the quadruped learn to make a left turn by only allowing it to choose a Z or a Y coordinate. So we leave the X and Z the same, and we only learn to make offsets to the Y, essentially allowing it to modify the Y by one centimeter. Of course, if you do it aggressively, it might fall down, so you gotta be careful. Um, okay, so our is installed. Let's start, this looks a bit familiar to the previous tutorial. We will already use a predefined uh, robot that we prepared for this tutorial. Um, in EGAX, you can, an object is basically uh, a collection of sensors, actuators, and states. And at runtime, you may select only a subset of them. 
So in this case, our Go One quadruped has the following sensors: so the joint position, the joint velocity, and force torque, and the orientation, position, and velocity of the base. Then it has a single actuator called the joint controller, and we will set it to um, a joint uh, controller. So it will convert design joints, uh, joint configurations into torques. And so that's oh. <laughs> Here I'll make the two uh, nodes. So we have the central pattern generator gate, and we produce and we create another node, which is called the Cartesian control node. And um, in a moment, in the next cell, we will uh, create an empty graph, which you see here. We create an empty graph, and we interconnect these two nodes. So basically, the, the x, y, z positions of the central pattern generator access the source, so the output, and they're connected to the Cartesian control uh, inputs. And then the Cartesian control uses um, forward kinematics, and then um, produce desired joint positions. And if we would just run it without modifying the Y, you would actually get a straight ahead trot that you can see here. Almost straight. Yeah, almost straight. That's a bit of an initialization. So we want to make it a left turn, as I said. So we will. Um, have as an input to this uh, central pattern generator an offset. And this offset is basically added to the, uh, to the uh, XYZ coordinates that the CPG gate uh, outputs. And it's uh, minus two plus one centimeter. So the robot produces all the sensor outputs that I just discussed. And you can select only a subset to be also a observation to the environment. So that's what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm telling um, Eager X that the joint positions, uh, so an observation called joint positions will be basically filled in by the joint position sensor. And we do this for all the centers. In a, instead of doing full 3D rendering, which can be quite a, a burden on the computations, we actually make a proxy. Uh, rendering I won't go into much detail, but essentially the graph that we have just now created would look something similar like this. So you have the CPG gate that takes as input this offset. You produce the uh, the X Y Z coordinates with the Cartesian control block, and this Cartesian control block then uh, sends the joint positions to the joint controller. And then after one time step, the quadruped will produce all kinds of sensor measurements that are then entering the environment as observations. So exercise one, um, which we will do lecture style, is to um, determine what the uh, reward function should look like in order for the quadruped to promote going left without falling down. Um, so any ideas? So basically, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, you can also uh, join and participate in the chat. So basically, we have these uh, sensors: so joint position, joint velocity, force, torque sensor, position. So what would be, just on the top of your head, maybe a, a relevant reward function to uh, promote the quadruped from going left? Any ideas? Orientation. Orientation, true. But perhaps if it would be orientation, we, we might want it to continuously turn. So maybe it's, uh, it's something like the, uh, First derivative of the orientation, so the rate. So I suppose that we want to create a reward function that's based on the yaw rate. So we want to promote uh, yaw rate. However, if you look at the list of sensors that we have, and we deliberately did so, of course, is that uh, let me go where is it? Oh, yeah, here. You don't see the angular, so you don't see the rate listed as a sensor. Nonetheless, you can use finite differencing to make an estimate of this rate. And in either X, when you connect sensors and actuators, you can actually um, decide how much what the window, so the number of last measurements you would like to have as an observation. So we, we use two here. So essentially, this allows us to, uh, to calculate the differences in y'all and then um, multiply, uh, multiply it with the rate such that we get an estimate of the y'all rate. So that's what I'm going to do right now. 
speak a bit. So let's mess up. So, So this is the R rate. We want to um, we want to track a design in R rate probably. This and um, ratings are a bit less hard to harder to interpret. So we would like to promote a yaw rate of approximately twenty degrees. So that's why we are operating them with gradients and then. Um, we're going to determine a yaw cost. So essentially, that's going to be a uh, L2 cost. Uh, typing in the pressure is kind of hard, but the rate. Right. And then. This is a cost, so don't forget to make it negative. And um, we do not only want to have a yaw rate, but we, because essentially this would maybe also make the rubble just basically spin as fast as it can without key staying on speed. So we also want to give it a little a life bonus so that it's also promoted to stay upright. Okay, so I think this is the, uh, the reward function. So now the, uh, the environment is initialized. And like I said, rendering full, full 3D images can be quite burdensome. So what we actually did is in here X is we, just as the CPG and Cartesian control are two nodes, we can also basically add another node which has as input the position the base of the particle bed. And in here, we make a simple rendering using OPCV and we connect that to the render terminal of our environment. So in this way, we still get uh, feedback while learning uh, without having to render full 3D images. And this rendering will look like this. It's a top view of the X, Y positions. And initially it will go and sort of walk straight ahead. But as learning progresses, you will see it making turns. Uh, are there any questions? Sorry, a light color should be given when it does not have a light color. Yeah, so the question is the alive bonus should be given only when it's not fallen. Yeah. That's true. You could also actually. Um, give also a penalty when it falls down. But the thing, because it's maximizing the cumulative reward, if, if it falls down, it will actually terminate. Um, and to maximize its reward, it should actually continue being alive, so being straight. And that's, that's why it, here it's still also fine to do it. The thing is, if you don't give the life bonus, it will learn to terminate as quickly as possible because the cost is only a cost. And to minimize the cost, is just to, to stop the episode as quickly as possible. That's what I was talking about, about termination and changing the task. So you should not yeah, change the wheel of the agent to, to stay alive. You can also see here, um, so we decide on whether to terminate, either due to the timeout or whether it has fallen down. And um, as the other one also mentioned that we set this flag in the uh, info date such that the algorithm can take uh, care of correctly incorporate the timeout. So yeah, here you see that it's 
slowly go in the other direction, <laughs> and eventually you um, start to turn. We didn't see that. We didn't see that. No. Yeah. no, it's not seated, so uh, you'll see hacking here. Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions, maybe? Also, just to mention, like uh, on Cola, in order to have it uh, give you a bit of feedback, we only uh, show the uh, lightweight render, so the low resolution uh, image. Yeah. It seems like in these sort of applications, they also know it's just always the default. Uh, is there ever any time when a different norm would be useful, or is that just kind of I think the, the norm does encode kind of the ultimate solution we will be getting. So I think the L2 norm promotes straight lines. Um, so, yeah. So, so the, the question is about whether to use L1 norm or L2 norm. So it, it depends actually what you want to do. For instance, here you want to have a small error and you want to penalize much more when you have large error than when you have small error. That's here and two make more sense. But if you really want to be at zero and penalize more the same way um, when you're a bit far away or really far away, so when you want functions to promote um, a small in your network promotes capacity. So here the L1 norm would also make sense. But it depends on your task. But at the end, it should it will probably give a similar result. But here L2 is mostly because you really want to penalize large, large error. And if you're close enough, then you should be close. So can you maybe can you, you maybe walk to the uh, microphone there? Yeah, thanks. How is the observation space being passed uh, this morning? Because I saw that. Data being passed by like there are different components of the observation space. So can you show us like, how those different parts are together in the model? Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, we have all the time in the world during, <laughs> during the training, so I'll just go through it. Um, so just to, just to quickly point out, so so basically in eager X, the setup in order to generate uh, an arbitrary environment is by it's essentially build up of the graph, and the graph is an interconnection of nodes and objects. So every node has its an outputs, and you can decide on whether you want to use an output of a node as an observation to your environment, or whether you just want to use this output as an interconnection within these nodes. So when I created this graph, I added the robot, um, the robot object, the Cartesian control, and the CPG nodes, and then interconnected them together. But then over here, I um, I um, registered some of the sensors of the robot as observations. And in EIX, and we also, you know, we also mentioned it in the first presentation, is that we promote modularity. And the idea is that you define an object, and inside this object, you already define the, uh, the spaces of all the sensors and actuators that are associated with this robot. Because essentially, often the robot dictates what the uh, action or observation space would be given that you would want to supply these actions. So that's why we save the, uh, the spaces inside this object. Um, you have all the freedom in the world to actually modify them if you want them to be smaller or larger. But that's why you don't see me literally typing in here what the action or observation space is, because normally it's tied to the robot. So at some point I even printed it. So here, right? So cpg dot inputs dot offset. So this actually gives us uh, the um, the low and the high of the uh, of the space. So in this case, for default, it's set to one centimeters. But I could have basically selected this here and set it to. Right, I could set them to two. Don't change if you want to run the policy. Yeah, I don't know. And that would have changed the action in that space. Let's 
So let's see how we're doing. Oh, so it's basically learning a circle already. Yeah. Um, we're almost there. So we're running for 30 episodes. Now we're going to start the evaluation. And basically, because we learned, we tried to learn a policy that is uh, just disregarding the global position, we can basically roll out the um, policy for longer time and it should start to, uh, to walk a circle. So now we do use the uh, full fledged 3D uh, image. And in a moment after this timer is done, we will, we will see the code of that model circle. Okay, you can see pixels. Yes, it's right. <laughs> More pixels here. Questions in the chat? No, there's no question in the chat, but we can still ask. Okay. So we train a policy that run for so during training, the episode length was 10 centimeters, and we will be now uh, evaluating for 40 centimeters, about 40 seconds. <laughs> and uh, it's late. Yeah. And as the second exercise, we, we were wondering um, what kind of sensors you would deem important for learning and which ones wouldn't be. So essentially, I saw I gave you a list of sensors. So for store, well, obviously the, the global position is probably not very useful for learning to uh, to turn because the agent might overfit on this uh, global position. Oh, so here we see yeah, a few pixels move. Yeah, and so basically in 30 episodes, we were able to modify the trot of the puzzle bed instead of walking straight to make a circle. And yeah, this is mainly to highlight that in your action, you can add nodes, low level nodes, and then uh, modify them slightly only to change the behavior, which can uh, greatly decrease the learning time you need. It's very important. Yeah. Um, So thank you everyone for uh, making it to the end. There were the only few <laughs> that succeeded and uh, yeah, still have the energy or at least maybe I have the energy not to leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like uh, obviously to thank my co-organizer. So Bas, Yeller and Jens. <laughs> I'd like to thank um, of course our two speakers. So both uh, Erwin and Angela. And, uh, and, and, and thank also people you didn't see, but that were helping us actually in the Discord for questions and things. So, and see Francesco, Costa, and I hope, uh, and Noah, of course. Um, all those people were actually uh, here in case there was uh, too many questions and, and they actually helped. So, thanks them. Now, I wish you a, a nice evening and rest well. I hope that you will actually try out uh, the, the tool that we, we've shown so far. We will provide, obviously, the solution. Um, and of course, if you have any feedback about uh, this tutorial or any other question, you can just contact us. Thank you. And yeah, have a nice evening. Nice rest of the week. <laughs>